Hello, my name is Håkon and welcome back to my channel where today I will talk a little bit about the Dreadbox Dysphonia and my plans for it. So I've done a few videos on this synthesizer, talking about it and also uh, more so demonstrating the kind of sounds that it can create. And those are some absolutely amazing sounds. I really like having the sonic palette that this gives me in my uh, setup. But there are a few buts about it, of course. First of all, it needs a case or a box of some sort. So. If you look here, it is, of course, still naked or semi-naked, I suppose. You've got the power supply down there. Um, that's one thing. Um, of course, I can make a box. I know how to do woodworking. I do have materials and tools. No problem. Second problem I have with this interface is that it's really, really cramped. Now, this is not a semi-modular synthesis voice um, like you sometimes get, like the uh, Pittsburgh Lifeforms or the Mother 32, etc. The advantage that a semi-modular synth voice has is that there are things inside it that are pre-patched. So, for instance, your oscillator would be pre-patched to... Uh, the the filter, for instance, the your LFO might be pre-patched to the oscillator um, or the envelope to the VCA, etc., etc. And it means that some of those really basic standard things that you would always do in a patch, you do not need to use a cable for them. But on this, nothing is pre-patched. This is, in fact, a modular synth in that sense, not semi-modular. Nothing is normal. Every single connection you want in your patch needs to be done. And I quite like that because it makes it easier for me to see what's going on. And it's also easier to loosen yourself from the pre-patching if you want to do something a little bit more esoteric, which I do. Um, but the problem then is that you get a lot of cables 
crammed all over this tiny user interface and it gets in the way of the controls. You have to sort of just sort of eke your way in there and just, and the cables are all sort of sticking up and in your way. Now, I know that uh, if you are a Eurorack user, this is not an uncommon problem uh, because this is Eurorack size and uh, a trend in Eurorack is to squeeze as much functionality as possible into as small a space as possible, which I do not like at all, actually. It's one of the things that puts me off getting into Eurorack, to be honest. Um, what I'm used to, I'll just show that just for comparison now. So I'm used to this. This is my first uh, synthesizer, the Kilpatrick Phenol. Uh, if you see the way that things are spaced out compared to the red box here, it is pretty much half as dense as this. And that makes it so much easier to work with patches. You can put in cables everywhere and still all the controls are easily accessible. It makes a huge difference. And of course, this is a much taller layout. This is more like what you get in the 4 or 5U modular system where space and the ergonomics, I suppose, of patching um, gets precedence over functionality in as small a space as possible. And it's a bit strange that Eurorack does this because when you think about it, your biggest cost is going to be the modules not the space, the rack space, that you use to put them in. So if all Eurorack modules doubled in size and gave you a lot more ergonomic controls, I think Eurorack would actually have been a better option for me than what it is at the moment. So in any case, I was thinking that uh, considering swapping in or selling this one, the Dysphonia, and instead buying a few Eurorack modules from Dreadbox to uh, fill in the same kind of sonic niche in my setup. So, for instance, that would primarily be actually uh, the filters. Um, would be the main thing, really, that I would sort of want to add to my setup. Uh, and maybe one of the modulators as well. Uh, because the Eurorack modules, the chromatic modules from Dreadbox, they are much better laid out than this one in terms of, of access to controls while things are patched in and while playing. But um, as I was looking at modular grid, and of course it is a bit dangerous considering going into Eurorack because there are so many options, what happened was, and I'm not sure if this is something that happens to others too, I start filling up my modular grid rack with things that I think that I want. I find some good VCAs, some uh, um, different, different um, signal generators, uh, VCAs, um, all kinds of things that look really nice, MIDI to CV, of course, uh, mixers, all that kind of stuff, the bread and butter stuff that you need. And then I started paring it down again and paring it down because I don't really need that. I don't really need that. And then in the end, I had so little left. And I was thinking, is there really that much going on that I want to add to my setup that I already have than what I already have? And it's not really. It's just the desire to have something else because you are feeling that the limitations you're working under are creative limitations, which usually is just an illusion. Um, and in any case, most of those functionalities that I wanted to add were already here. It's just I didn't enjoy using them so much because of the cramped interface. So I got a plan. And as Baldrick would say, a cutting one. Because another thing that you may notice, of course, uh, if you look at these side by side, is that my main synthesizers, I've got two of these, the Kilpatrick Phenol uses banana jacks, and of course the Dreadbox Dysphonia uses mini jacks, standard Eurorack cables. And I do have some conversion cables, um, four of them that I can use to connect one to the other, um, and I also have uh, mini jack to audio to regular quarter inch jack audio cables that I can plug into the audio input of the 
phenol, so I can interface quite a bit with the dysphonia already, but not entirely. Um, and then there are two options, really. Uh, one is to have a conversion box. So I have a little box where I have mini jack sockets and I have banana sockets and they're connected together. And also there would be a ground connection so I can make sure that uh, the dread box is co correctly um, grounded or rather uh, to uh, got the same common voltage reference to be correct as the phenol. And that's all fine and good, but if I were to use something like that, I would actually add more cables and I would still have the cramped interface of the dysphonia. So I moved on to plan B uh, and I'm going to show you in a minute. So I'm just going to just show you in the air now. So my idea is that because this is a DIY synth and of course the case is quite wide open and I know where everything is because I sold it all these myself what I can do is to add a patching panel on the right or the left technically um, probably on the right that's sort of the traditional now um, I'm not 100% sure though because I feel that in my setup I would want my pheno on the left and my dysphonia on the right in which case a patching panel on the left would make more sense but I haven't I don't have to decide that just yet um, and the idea is that I add a patching panel so I add a parallel connection to each of these um, these connectors not all of them because for instance a multi here uh, is not needed because if you use banana jacks, each output is its own passive mode. You just stack cables. So you don't need that. You also wouldn't need multiple inputs, for instance, for the 12 dB filter um, or two CB inputs for the oscillator, for instance. Um, so I wouldn't need as many patch points as are here, uh, first of all. And um, so, and then I've added that as a patching panel that is better spaced out. And of course, it doesn't have to be that well spaced out because it is out of the way of the controls. And I laid out in a way that uh, feels logical relative to the layout of the dysphonia. So I know where everything is. Uh, and I would then use that to both do the patching on the dysphonia out of the way and I would use it to interface with the phenol. So it's a win-win. Um, so two things in one, actually it's three things in one because it would also be part of a case. So I would have used wood to create top, bottom here, like a little box, uh, end cheek, and then a little space here before the next end cheek. And maybe I'll make it exactly the same width probably as the Erebus, I think. So I can put them next to each other and it would make sense. Um, and of course, since I'm making this patch bay in parallel to this, um, that means that these ones can also still be used instead, uh, or in addition to the patch bay on the side. So um, 
that is my current DIY plan for the dysphonia. I was sort of sitting a bit on the fence about this for a while and because I was also considering uh, going with the Eurorack modules rather than using the dysphonia, uh, I was also considering selling it, which I probably could have made a bit of a profit because it is assembled, it is unavailable, it is hard to get, it is a very good synthesizer actually. Um, but in the end, I've decided to keep it, at least for now, and to expand its functionality to make it more, to make it easier to use together with my phenol. Now, another, another thing I was considering actually was to add an audio mixer as well to it. I think I'm going to skip that because in many cases, of course, I'm not going to use it as, um, I'm going to take audio from different places in the, um, on, on the module actually. There's no sort of end of line place where I will definitely always take the audio from. Um, often it would be from the EVCA, it could be from the mixer, it could be from the filters, it could be from the echo. So, um, which wouldn't have been too hard to, to sort out actually as a uh, an audio output with a switch um, to select the uh, where the audio came from, but I think I'll just leave that. Um, another thing that I may or may not do is to put in a full-size MIDI connector instead of this one. I haven't decided yet. Um, and, of course, while it would have been possible now to put this in a um, powered Eurorack case, in fact, you actually get powered pods that are 42 HP in the exact right width of this, uh, which means I could actually would make it a little bit smaller. Um, the USB power supply works fine, um, and but what I'm thinking when I'm putting an end cheek here now, it will get a bit in the way. So what I will do is I'll get a an angled cable going the other way than this. This is another one I've got here now. Um, so it will be extend about that much, um, possibly, um, unless I jig something so that this plug is in a different direction, but I think it's probably easier just to leave it the way it is and rather have the extra width here. So I'm going to have a, like a slot in the side cheek that allows me to, uh, with an extension cable actually. So this will be, the angle will be an extension. It goes, will go back and it will go into the case and then come out the back and that's where you can plug in the power. That's the idea I have at the moment for how to power it. Um, <clears throat> so that's going to show you now on my computer screen actually um, the kind of layout sort of mock-up that I've started making. Uh, to, just to show you uh, the idea, I've, I'll still I'm sort of making changes all the time when I'm doing these sorts of things, but um, I'm sort of... It's always a work in progress until it's done, really. Um, right. Right, so here we are on my screen, and uh, as you can see, I've got a picture of the dysphonia that I put in here to scale, uh, to so I can see how things will look next to it. Um, I'll just put on some and cheeks here just to see what that looks like and I've tried making a layout now for the uh, connectors that I need for this ex expansion uh, extension to the dysphonia. Um, as I was working on this initially I thought this might be another color and that I would use colors on the jacks to denote different functions but in the end I think I'm going to put in labels and, uh, and make it the same kind of style as the dysphonia panel, uh, which means I probably will end up using uh, basically just black uh, banana sockets um, for this project. Uh, another thing I had to do was, of course, find the right font. Now, uh, that's one thing that there are a few uh, websites online where you can search for fonts. So what I did was I took some text from the uh, Dysphonia user manual that I could zoom in on uh, using the same font, which gave me a really clear picture. And then I used that picture and put it into a font search engine and it found, found me the right font, which was a free font that I could download and I could use that for my labels. So I've started now sort of doing the same kind of aesthetic um, 
for the labels as there are on the um, front panel of the dysphonia itself. Um, so this is very roughly how it's going to look like at the moment. I still haven't finished doing this uh, with the labels and the titles, but I'm going to put in all these things. And one thing I had in mind that I may yet do is to put in a full-size MIDI socket. As you can see, there is room for a full-size MIDI socket. I had one here somewhere. Let's see if I just zoom out a bit. Um, I used to... I think I've lost it now. I used to have a... Uh... This is just some other DIY synth stuff I've been doing. I used to... Yeah, well, that's not the right one. Anyway, I can't seem to find it now. Um, but... Um, I could put in a MIDI socket as well. Um, on on this, this panel as well to... Um, yeah. Because it is easier to work with a full-size MIDI. But the thing about the MIDI socket is, if I want to include the MIDI socket, I want the MIDI controls to be on the right, because I want the MIDI connector to be close to the edge of the patch panel. Um, it just doesn't feel right for a MIDI cable to come right down in the middle of something, I feel. So it should be on the corner or on the edge of, of the panel. Um, in which case I'd move these. So I'm, I may yet move things around a little bit, but I will sort of lay it out in the logical fashion that is similar to the layout of the dysphonia itself, so I don't have to search for things. Um, and I'm going to label everything so it's clear, and I'm going to use, um, <clears throat> just like on the front panel itself here, uh, these sort of pinkish, purplish, boxes, the cartouches around the inputs, and uh, maybe something like this around sections, um, just to make it clear what belongs together. And um, yeah, so that's that's the kind of plan I have. And, and right underneath here, this is just the layout, the uh, size of a, a Dreadbox Erebus, just for size comparison, just so I can see that it will look nice together on my desk as well, and when I keep them both out at the same time. Right, so that is what I wanted to show you today, how I'm planning now to make a little expansion um, panel for the dysphonia. I'm going to make other videos now about this process, both about making the panel, about making the wooden box around it as well, the end cheeks, all that stuff. I'm going to do some little videos on my progress because I know other people are interested in doing similar things sometimes, but they don't know where to start. So I'm going to do that. And um, hopefully it'll work fine. I hope I won't break anything. It's it's actually very hard to break electronics if as long as you're just soldering connectors on jack sockets and things like that. So um, yeah, I hope it'll work out fine anyway. And uh, but you will see if you <laughs> keep looking at my content. Uh, see if anything else shows up about this. Now at the moment I can't really do much uh, woodworking, uh, which of course is one of the things I have to do before I do anything else. Um, and that is because it is really cold in my woodworking shop, i.e. the garage, um, this time of year. Um, we did have a warm spell a few weeks ago, which is when I, or several weeks ago, when I made, made my desk. Um, but 
at the moment it is cold and windy and I do not want to work there until it is about 10 degrees uh, inside. So I need to be seven degrees outside and then I'm, I'm usually fine. Um, so thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. So goodbye for now. Bye bye.